I have fulfilled my role. <laughs> there we go. Okay, uh, what uh, makes a successful debate for a voter as far as the statewide and legislative debates? So what do you all think? Oh, first, we should probably just pick a spokesperson. So after all this, who who wants to take the lead and be the spokesperson and kind of digest all this information? I'd like to nominate Bob. No. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Any other? I want to participate, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to draw straws. I didn't bring a pen. So. I, I will say, I, I would say this: our our preference would be to have a, a somebody who's, um, you know, on the task force be the report out person rather than Avery and I. But if it or I. Uh, However, if 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 all of you think that would interfere with your participation in the discussion, then I, I'm we'll 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 have we, we can do it that way. I think you'd be great, Tom. I know, sure. <laughs> okay. Right, Paul. Right, Paul. Sure. <laughs> Without right. objection. Right. Fair enough. All right. Fair enough. I will take notes. I'm taking notes as well. So, okay, let's let's go back to the the uh, question, the prompt. Uh, what makes a successful debate for a voter? And, and this is I'll open my big mouth. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Rod. I guess, um, you know, I, I've been, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in the last 20 years helping candidates prepare for debates. And um, one thing I've learned is that, um, you know, viewers are often sort of uh, uh, incredibly sharp about people, even if they're not really informed about issues. And so I think one thing that people get from debates is just kind of like they really get to a read on a person through like all kinds of nonverbal and body language and tone of voice and how they interact with others. Um, I think one, one thing that's really useful about the debates is that you really kind of get to see how the person operates. So that's sort of irrespective of, you know, what do they think the right education funding mechanism is, um, but just how people, uh, how candidates kind of behave. I think that's hugely important. I, if I can, I, I, I think there's two, two, two things of thought here. There's debate and how successful for the public and it's a debate on how it's successful for the candidate. And it's because you want the candidates to participate. You've got to give them some feeling that there's going to be some sort of success and not going to be driving off the cliff. But as, as uh, Roger said, yeah, the public is going, to, is going to get to see the candidate. The problem that I mentioned earlier uh, is that if you don't separate the House and the Senate, you really don't get to see enough of the candidate uh when you have uh f let's say there's two running for the uh, in each each party that's four six people and you only have a certain amount of time and you get down the line with the same question you really don't draw out what you really want to hear from the candidate so <laughs> separating it the senate and separating the house candidates and, uh, and paul has been in the house and he's been in the senate he'll probably shake his head with me on these I think it 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 affects the candidate from the standpoint that why am I sitting here with people discussing things that aren't running for the same office I'm running for? And it it also creates a situation where if you have a very strong candidate running, let's say for the House, and you're running for the Senate, the you know basically being able to. Uh, uh, monopolize the the event in, in, in itself so I, I i felt it was i was always frustrated by the point that when there were senate candidates running when i was running for the house that were in my debate and i and i because i wanted to truly have a dialogue with the people that i was running with and against uh and and it, it just added to added two other people to the mix and it made it more challenging because they felt like they were running against me at the same time so I, I didn't, I didn't, my experience, 
my experience as a candidate wasn't was somewhat I don't know I won't say negative but it, it created some negativity and the experience from the public was that they said hey you only got to answer three questions yeah. mm -hmm. and here it is Rod you prepared the guy for how long or whatever and you get to answer three questions you're like what's your favorite color and uh you know what 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 what's the easiest food to to buy down at the Capitol and and so they really didn't get any, really didn't get anything. The public didn't really get anything at it. And neither did the candidates. So I, I think that you have to look at it from both perspectives. Is the public going to get a value? And is the candidate going to get a value if they show up? And I, I think by uh, separating the two, you create uh, the distinction that they are two separate offices that people are running for. How are you, Paul? Yeah, to add on to that, uh, I, I remember a, a debate pretty vividly. Uh, Luigi uh, used to be Cap Times, uh, was my interviewer, or you know, he's the debate person. And he said, okay, what are your thoughts on immigration? You have one minute. Right. <laughs> and so I'm like, how do I <laughs> expound all of my views on this really complicated, nuanced issue in one minute? And so I, I think if we could have... Um, the question and the time allotment relative to the the gravity of the question uh, that that would be very bad. I think that'd be helpful, especially for the public and also for the candidate as well. I think Ronaldo has his hand up. Okay. Yeah, I, I think if I'm reading the question right, I think really around issues and topics, having really serious issues. Um, sometimes I watch debates and some of the issues, uh, I guess, Paul, you gave an example. You give a person one minute to answer a very complex question, but also making sure that we have key issues that impact the state. Sometimes I think there are stories out there that are very popular in the story for the story itself, but they really didn't address the issues. Give example, you know, Arizona has a water crisis. Um, was that discussion um, during the debate in terms of water, a water policy. So those things uh, I think are important. And also um, I, I represent in terms of my role on this group is, is uh, voters with disabilities. There are, I did a little research before this meeting today. There are 1,382,191 adults in Arizona with disabilities. When I look at these debates, I don't really see topics around persons with disabilities. That's one out of twenty, uh, one out of uh, five people. So that's twenty-five percent of the population. So my thing is make sure when we have topics that they are serious topics, and that we give our uh, representatives an opportunity to answer those questions, but not tell the story. So it's a balance between answering questions and really addressing few key issues in, that affect Arizonans. So that's kind of my 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 insight into um, what makes a, an effective for a voter, really getting good information, not fluff, not avoiding questions, but really, really good in, issues that impact the Arizonans. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ronaldo. And I saw that uh, Mr. Jennings had his hand raised. Do you want to speak? And then we'll get to you, uh, Representative De Los Santos. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Avery. Uh, I think um, the question, what makes a successful debate for a candidate is the one we're answering, right? Yeah, uh, yeah um, for a voter. For the oh, vote. for a voter. Yeah. Okay, voters, well, voters. I, I mean, I, I think uh, my comment uh, speaks to both the voter and the candidate, but um, in debates, it's easy to for things to go off the rails and go into kind of the you know, the cesspool pit of, you know, conversation that really doesn't address the issues. For instance, like um, uh, Mr. Boyer said on immigration or whatever the case is, Ronaldo. So I think the, the, the moderator is exceptionally important and somebody that is strong enough that can control the direction of the, of the debate, because the last thing, uh, uh, you know, a candidate wants or even a voter wants is to watch a, a you know, a, 
basically a, a sidecar clown show that gets us nowhere. But, you know, um, you know, all of the, you know, the ancillary conversations or topics are covered without actually focusing on the issues at hand. So I think um, even though, uh, you know, journalists tend to have a better understanding of the issues, you've got to have a journalist. And it sounds like that's where you're leading. Um, you've got to have somebody that's got a very strong command of, of the, the circumstance and ability to control the direction of, of, the, of the debate. Okay. okay. I like that. Sounds good. Uh, Representative uh, De La Santos, if you'd like to speak. Yes, thank, thank you. you um, a, couple, a couple of things, I suppose. The first is what I really liked in my debate was that the questions uh, that the that the reporter asked, that the moderator asked, were really tailored to Republicans and Democrats. So uh, sometimes we got the same question, but I'm remembering really specifically on the question of abortion, it was tailored so that um, the Republican couldn't sort of squirm away with a sort of canned answer. And then when it was phrased for the Democratic candidates, it was phrased in such a way so that a Democrat couldn't get away with a canned answer. It was really tailored to pin us down um, and and to speak clearly uh, and not in sort of generalities, right? We, we were we were getting down on the nitty gritty policy. Um, and and so I thought that was very useful was uh, to tailor the questions for different candidates of different ideal ideologies. Um, in such ways that that don't allow us to simply get away with whatever we've put on our website or Twitter or what what have you. Um, so that's the first suggestion. I think another interesting thing is um, I'm wondering if um, the, it, the debates were very long, at least mine were. There were multiple candidates. It was a multiple hour long affair, which was very great for me. Uh, I assume that not that many people stayed on for the whole thing. And I'm wondering if there's a way for, for the commission to clip parts of the debate. Now, obviously, that goes potentially into, into the lines of editorializing what a candidate might may have said. But I'm wondering if there's even ways to clip questions right and and so it be, you're taking a three-hour thing into maybe a 10-minute segment on particular issues and if, if though clipping it that way and putting it on social media might make it more digestible for for a broader audience who may not have the time to sit for three hours and watch a, a debate that's a good idea i like that thank you representative uh, uh mr boyer you have a question and then we'll move on to the next question or you have a comment go ahead yeah, just really a com uh, yeah, just really a comment. So uh, to follow up on everything, I, I anecdotally, I do think the reporters make the best moderators just because they're used to, especially how we get in uh, candidates off their talking points. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's best for for voters because you want to know what the candidate is really going to be like and how they're going to vote when in office and not just whatever the canned responses are. Um, the questions really ought to be, and this is not in disagreement with anybody who's said already talked, but just making sure that they're on point to whatever the office is that we actually have purview over. So while I was happy, and I, I, I mentioned the immigration issue, I was happy to speak to it, but Article 1 doesn't really give us the opportunity to have much purview, if really at all, on that particular topic, or uh, what, what, what are my thoughts on presidential tariffs? Well, who cares? <laughs> I mean, it's like, I can answer that. I'm happy to answer that. But at the end of the day, it's not disability issues or water or, uh, you know, whatever else uh, that we really actually have purview over. And so, yeah, that, that, that was pretty much it so far. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's, let's move on to the next question here. So there's one more, there's one more hand up. I see Avery, uh, Lisa. Uh, yes. Lisa, did you want to quickly go over this so we can move on to the next question? Yes, Representative I just want to echo uh, Representative de los Santos uh, comment about clipping them that's actually very crucial because you know our audience is not very active and when I was doing my debate it was very few turnouts you know maybe two you know at the most and it's only one party that always shows up because we're such a safe uh, district so you, we don't get the two parties so the clipping and setting up that one question that we can put on our social media with ease and and um, you know just having that option right. helps a lot because that would be readily spread because sometimes.
whoever shares it may be interested in that one particular question subject matter, like election right. or abortion or the integrity of it. So that will work out really nicely. You guys can maybe even create a little portfolio of the questions and the clips with it and even go across districts with the questions that wasn't asked in my particularly that may be interested for my platform and so forth. That's just a suggestion. Okay, that's an excellent idea from both of you. Thank you. Um, so we have our voter hats on. As voters, why would we tune in to a debate in the first place? It's, it's my district. These people are running. Why, why would I tune in? Like, what do you think that would make a voter want to tune into it? So, so you want me to start off again? <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you tune in because you want to get you tune in because you want to get information. Uh, also, you tune in because you want to see how the candidate you like is doing. <laughs> Quite candidly, a lot of you know, a lot, a lot of times you have a perception of a candidate, and then you watch a you watch a forum or a debate, and you go, "Oh, wait a second, yeah, you know, this person's really gone far afield." So. Ultimately, it's knowledge, but at the same time, it's uh, maybe for your own partisan uh, look to just check in and make sure that the person you you support is is going to be the person you want to vote for ultimately. That's a good point. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Robson. Uh, uh, I, Anusha, I see you have your hand up. Yes, hi. So I'm a little bit late, but I was just going to add, like, especially from someone coming from the younger side of the demographic spectrum. I just think it's really important to see like how they act, how they deal with hard questions and like how they will cater to like, you know, the future leaders, like what do they have to offer for supporting for youth and all of that. So that's really important for me personally, um, especially when we are talking about like wide ranging topics of climate change and education, like kind of seeing um, their platforms as like someone previously mentioned as well too but I think honestly just how they connect with the people and their demeanor um, are very big okay uh, thank you thank you and I, and I have a question so how do you all feel about uh, like cognitive friction like when you have a debate and there are two opposing ideas and it's not necessarily an argument but it kind of gets into that and I know that uh, those debates tend to be more entertaining so how do you all feel about that do you think that maybe the debate shouldn't go that way or do you think that the moderator should encourage uh, the the conversation against uh, you know dissenting uh, viewpoints? Don't call it a debate if you're not going to have that happen. Right, right. I mean, you know, call it a roundtable or something. But a debate is a debate, and as long as you're both civil, uh, and it goes, but you know, the moderator keeps it, you know, where they need to keep it. By all means, you should have those challenges going on. It's Otherwise, you're just handing out a trophy for everybody that participates. But, but given that, though, I, I do think, though, that the, the focus should be on the, the idea and not the person. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I know that the, the debates that were it is focused on you know, attacks, personal attacks. I mean, those are interesting, uh, I guess. But I still think it should be focused, you know, always going back, having the moderator go back to, OK, but here's the idea. Tell me why this idea is wrong or why you want to mm -hmm. promote it this idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we got uh, some other hands. Uh, let's, uh, Representative Sun, would like to speak to this issue? Thanks, Avery. I, I think that for, for my district, I'm only going to be speaking with my district. Again, it's a safe uh, you know, district, and usually our race is in the primary, and it can be just as heated and, and um, aggressive, you know, to say um, as a general race. So with that said, I recall that our moderator, the reporter, did encourage us to be uh, forthcoming in our opinions and whatnot. But but to allude to what uh, Mr. Boyer was saying is that we still need to have a level of civility uh, in conduct in terms of personal, um, you know, attacks like we need to focus on the policy and the subject matter and really push for that. And I think that will make it more entertaining because the audience is there for information, you know, credible information on this debate. So I'm not discouraging to be contentious, but just based on the subject matter and the policies that we're addressing, not so with the uh, personal attacks. I think that kind of derails the purpose of the, I mean, it derails the 
minutes. Yeah. We lost it. <laughs> and I'm sorry, just a quick technical question uh, before Chairman Kimball uh, uh, pulls us back together. Kathy, just want to make sure. So we're still good with recording. And since we're back in the main session, are we live streaming to YouTube? So when we are in breakout rooms, the main room continues to live stream. So the breakout rooms are not included in the YouTube live stream. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so will the spokesperson for group A please report back to the entire group? Um, were, were we group A? I was yeah, I, that's a good question. Were we group A, Gina? <laughs> but, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we will be group A now. We'll go ahead and we can have uh, Tara report back. <laughs> okay, Tara. All right, thank you. To be successful, a debate needs to be accessible to voters, both in timing and the platforms used. This might, for example, include recording the debate and remarking it or making it available on demand. The debate and the reformatted or on-demand versions should also allow interaction with voters in a way that is respectful and informative. Decorum is important, as is having modera moderators who have knowledge of issues specific to the geographic regions represented. We should create environments that allow the voters to learn and that tries to make it entertaining and informative. Communication and advertising are important, including information about the topics that will be discussed. We should consider alternative formats that allow voters to receive or to participate or receive information in smaller or bite-sized formats, while also being mindful that the debates need to focus on voter education. It can be challenging to find the balance that allows for an engaging discussion and that also allows the moderator to control decorum. Having clear rules ahead of time helps. Nonetheless, it is a difficult challenge to keep candidates from making personal attacks while also ensuring that the moderator appears unbiased. Thank you, Tara. That as a member of Group A, that was a very good summary of everything we discussed. Um, what about Group B? Um, would the spokesperson for Group B report on what you discussed? So, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time in our group, um, I became the reporter, notwithstanding I'm not supposed to be. So I, I beg your forgiveness for that. I, um, I think we will. <laughs> That will be fine. Now we'll be here from Tom Collins, who is the executive director of Clean Elections. Um, so I think that uh, our group uh, discussed many of the same uh, points that um, uh, Tara just talked about. I think a, a thing that we heard um, was from a couple of folks in the group was about how important it is to give uh, folks an opportunity to see candidates interact and this may be their only opportunity to get a read on who candidates are as leaders how they interact with others um you know uh as far as as far you need something that works for both candidates and the voter uh and some of the things that um will go into that are you know tailoring the questions to make sure that they are representative of party positions you know you you may have very different partisan positions. You need to account for that. You need to account for the diversity of the state. For example, um, about one fifth of the state or, or a quarter of the state has a disability of some kind. That's not a topic that often gets addressed. That would be a group of voters that are that that are looking for information. On the other hand, some topics like immigration we might spend some a lot of time on, but quite honestly, in most state and legislative debates, that's simply not a relevant topic. I think we uh, are group also talked about the disability issue and wanting to have engaged debates where you really have some intellectual and, and ideological friction that stays civil and not personal. Uh, and then uh, finally, in order to, uh, and then I think there was a general consensus, it seemed that 
moderators who are journalists are good in, and especially those who both can control the tenor of the debate, but also can, um, um, if you will, get a, uh, or a, a candidate off their talking points, right? So get in depth enough on the issue where necessary to get specific answers on policy. Um, and, then, um, and then the idea of how to increase participation by providing other ways of packaging these. Um, uh, two of our uh, members um, mentioned specifically how we might be able to take clips from debates, how we might be able to make sure those get distributed more broadly uh, in a way where a person who might not have the time to sit through a larger debate, a longer debate, uh, can, can get access to that information. Okay, thank you, Tom. A lot of a lot of good suggestions from both groups. Some uh, that um, were specific to one group, and some that both groups brought up. Uh, so, so I thought that went very well. Um, for uh, item number nine, uh, we're going to break out again, following the same process we used for the previous breakout session. But this time, we're going to talk about what makes a successful debate for a candidate. Uh, we talked last time what makes us for a successful debate for the voter, but now we're going to focus on the candidate and uh, what we can do to uh, to make debates better for them. Um, so, Kathy, is there anything we have to do to uh, to break out again? No, just one question, uh, maybe for Gina. Would you like me to set a timer for the second round of breakout rooms? I currently have it for twenty minutes. Um, but should that be extended? I, I think 20 minutes will put us right on track. That uh, way we can still get to our call to the public and adjournment. So, and, and have our wrap up, of course. So yes, if we can uh, limit the next discussion for about 20 minutes, and then again, keeping Tom and Avery together and myself and, and Chairman Kimball, that would be perfect. Yes, uh, opening you. the breakout room again. We are back. Still recording. Okay, we're good. Thank you, Tom. You did an excellent job on that. Uh, <laughs> that was great. I don't know if we have the same folks in this as we had before. I can't quite. Oh yeah, no, we're a little mixed up with this one. Okay, that's fine. There's some different faces in here. Some same ones. Okay. Well, we can get started again. I'm Avery Zola, the board education manager, and of course, our executive director Tom Collins is also <laughs> with us. Uh, we have a few questions, but do, are, who's the spokesperson? Are we are we keeping time, or someone else would like to step up to the plate? Well, now, Tara and I are in the same room now, so I think Tara has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fine. Whatever you want me to do. Is that like voluntold? Is is that the word? Yeah. That? I was going to voluntold you. You oh. did a great job last time. <laughs> yes. You did it whatever works. We only have, a, you know, Gina has us on a. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, first, first question to the group would be, uh, why would a candidate uh, agree to a debate? Like, what are some pros and cons to, I guess, agreeing to a debate? I. Paul has his hand up. Oh yes, go ahead, Paul. Sorry. Yeah. So. Um... It is a struggle to get candidates there sometimes. And so just to make sure that every candidate gets a fair shake. And so that way, if uh, candidates feel confident going in, that they'll be able to get their opinions out there and not just uh, an unfair moderator. Uh, somebody pointed out in the last session that there typically tends to be one party that, that shows up. And I've always faithfully showed up as far as I can recall, uh, even though I was in the minority. Um, so just making sure that, yeah, the moderator is fair and then Again, and I mentioned this in the last discussion, but that uh, relative to the question and the nature of the topic, that you're able to actually just expound your views. Okay, thank you. Oh, did you freeze up there? I think you froze up a little bit. Um, um, Mr. Fowler, Ronaldo, go ahead. I see you have your hand raised. Or no? Um, Ms. Jackson. Thanks, Avery. You, I, okay. I fine. okay. So I, I think um, someone had mentioned about some of the candidates have not shown up for debates. And I think if they're safe districts, they don't show up. And also, I think there are topics. I, I, I've gone to a couple of debates around disability issues, and 
you can pretty much guarantee what party would show up for the debate because they thought the topic itself was biased. And so how do you how do you how do you deal with that? Um, and it's specific, it was around disability related issues. And so I, I think, you know, candidates need to understand that all issues have a different perspective and they're not owned by one political perspective. And I think it's helpful that they may give a different perspective that might necessarily might not be popular to that group, but I think it's important because I think it's pretty disrespectful um, that candidates just don't show up because of a specific topic or demographics of a person. I've seen that happen too, where candidates don't show up because it might be a certain demographics and that demographics don't necessarily maybe vote for them, but I think we want to encourage candidates to even go into those settings um, where there's traditional settings that may not be a safe setting for them. So that's kind of my my two cents on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'll go, no, go ahead. Uh, having participated yeah. in a couple of these uh, debates as a candidate, you won't get people, candidates to come unless they're forced to come if they're running clean or they're the minority party in a legislative district Unless you get everybody to participate, and you do that by uh, advertising and getting the information out of the debate results to more platforms, people will decide to come when they think that everything is going to be out there all over. And I think particularly for down ballot candidates, like in a rural county where I am running for state legislature, we get very little press coverage and we got very little press coverage from the clean elections debates. If the commission can make more of an effort to get the information out, you may get all candidates to participate. Thank you. That's the point. Thank you. Uh, let's go. Uh, uh, member Jackson. Go ahead. Um, sorry, I'm busy writing your notes uh -huh. while I'm talking. So, but I, I wanted to address the candidates not showing up and incentives for them to show up. And this this kind of gets back to the comment I made when we were all together, especially as there's a rising number of independents and thinking about uh, the candidate debates for the primaries is how do you incentivize uh, candidates to, to come to these debates? Part of it is if they think they need to appeal to a broader audience. And that's another reason perhaps to look at changes on um, who can be a part of the debates and especially included unaffiliated or independent voters or, or candidates makes it broader. It also would address some of the, um, the opinions that someone uh, brought up. I can't remember because I was looking down writing the notes that the candidates also need to come with the idea of learning from the debates, that that should be one of the goals that it's also for them to learn. It's not just for the voters. Excellent point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move on to our next question. So, we, so we're running out of time here. So just to keep with the candidates um, we, about why they would agree to a debate. Now, what are some reasons why a candidate would reject the debate? Flat out say, I refuse to participate for whatever reason. In your experience, what do you think? And let's go with uh, uh, Representative De La Santos, and then I will go to you, uh, Ms. Simpson. Um, yeah, I think to, to an earlier speaker's point, they just don't think anybody's watching. Um, so you have nothing to lose. And the second thing is, I think uh, candidates are terrified of making mistakes uh, and making a gaffe, right? Appearing to look, say the wrong thing. And I think one thing that might help folks out, and I know this, this is sort of done, is actually having the questions in advance. Now, I know that that could be controversial um, because it gives you more time to prepare. Uh, a, a sort of canned answer. But on the other hand, I think it would, one, incentivize people to show up and, and might actually promote more thorough, thought, well thought out answers um, if you know what you're going to, if you know what you're going to say. And so long as the questions are phrased in such a way that don't really allow you to wiggle out of, of giving a direct answer and the moderator's good about following up to make sure that you're giving a clear, direct answer, I think potentially providing candidates questions in advance might be uh, might be a good thing. I also think, um, you know, 
it's sort of rare in my time in the legislature so far that you are speaking about an issue extemporaneously that you've never thought about. Like typically you're speaking about something that you're actually quite well versed in, hopefully. Right. Um, and so I think like this, the skill set is not being able to come up with an answer on the fly, but rather can you do your homework and come up with a thoughtful position to share with the public? That's a good point, great point. Thank you, uh, Representative De Los Santos. Uh, uh, Member Simpson, if you would go ahead. So two things, I just, I, and I wonder, Tom may be able to speak to this. Um, what are some of the reasons that candidates decline to participate? I mean, we know the obvious one is the perceived um, bias of the moderator. I don't know if there's another reason um, to that. Yeah, fundraising. Yeah, if, well, I, if, if I may, Lisa uh, and Avery, I, I think the two people that would be best to probably weigh in on that would be Rod and Lee. Uh, and if Constantine okay. too, I, um, but Rod's got his hand up anyways. But because uh, I, 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 I mean, what we hear is effect essentially uh, some of the things that were been captured by the speakers already. Mm. It doesn't matter. It's not our crowd. There's nothing to gain. Mm. But uh, as far as how that gets evaluated, I think Rod or or if you or whoever wanted to take that, I think that that's the heart of the question. I really I I can't get beyond the. Okay. Okay. I, I don't. I didn't know who to address that to. Yeah, but no, that's, no, it's a good question. Yeah. I think people have really nailed it. It's people don't do it because they either feel like the process is biased against them, or as a uh, representative De Los Santos said, no one wants to get up there and say the wrong thing being taped. Um, I I would say that the way you deal with this, or the way we should think about dealing with it, is just getting more people to watch. I mean, when you're when you're running, you're trying to break through to an audience. You have very limited funds. You're trying to get in front of people. So if you get more people watching, then it becomes harder to skip. And if you do skip, there's a bigger price to pay. So then it, you, the real thing I think we're going to have to wrestle with in the course of this um, working group over the next few weeks is how do we get more people to watch? And that's why I was asking earlier about the advertising budget. And um, I don't think this is an easy challenge at all. But I know that um, one thing that um, came out of some of the uh, polling that was done in Georgia before the special elections uh, for Senate, the runoff election for Senate, was that um, low information voters, the kind of people who don't often vote, uh, they don't even necessarily know what the job is. So if you could like kind of advertise it to like hear from the people who decide how much money your kid's school gets. Hear from people who are going to decide how, how Arizona is going to deal with its water crisis. Hear from the people who are going to decide X. Um, letting the voters actually know what the job is is very basic information, but it actually um, really uh, made an impression and helped drive voter turnout among low information voters in Georgia in the runoff earlier this year. Thank you. That's a great point. There's never enough advertising. I had a second point. Uh, I'm sorry, Avery, to interrupt. Oh, go ahead. Um, is does it make sense to uh, Representative De Los Santos to his his point earlier? Would it be helpful to have a pre-debate meeting with the moderators where they're? I don't know that you're going to ever get um, us to agree to give you the question, but perhaps to give the topics and to talk through the format and to get people more comfortable with the moderator that's going to be asking the questions. Thank you, Lisa, thank you, that was good. Um, Member Miller, please, if you have any uh, comments. Sure, um, the, the candidates that I've worked with through the past several years, uh, the Queen Elections debate is one of, you know, an array, many, many, uh, opportunities the the candidate has to get in front of a group, and um, the Queen Elections debate. Um, on the assumption I'm not a Queen Elections candidate, uh, it, the question is simply: Is is this the best use of my time on this day? And the best use of my time is focused on um, doing what I need to do to win. Um, are, are the are the people I'm going to reach? Uh, in this particular debate at this particular time, folks who 
I can convert to, you know, my to supporting my candidacy uh, when it's time to vote. Um, and um, uh, it, it's the candidates that I work with, to be blunt, they don't regard the clean elections debate as anything special. Um, it's just another uh, opportunity. And if it's the best use of our time on that day, we'll be there. Uh, if it's not, um, we'll be where we think we've got a better opportunity to, to reach our voters. I, I'd like to follow up on that, Go if ahead. I can. Yeah, sure, Bob. Um, I want to focus on candidates that are willing to be at the debate. And one of the problems that I had is you go to the debate and the topics suddenly are not even relevant to the campaign that you're running, that people have have been talking about in your district. And the, the moderator goes off or they take audience questions that are just totally irrelevant to, this, to the level, if you're running for state legislature, you'll get something about federal abortion law or something. And there we are. We're now doing one minute each on that. And if the, we're talking about making it good for the candidates. And the candidates that show up should be respected enough to have a good experience. And I think one of the big problems is they're not having a good experience. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for like one more question. Let's. Um, so what does a candidate need to prepare for in, in debate? They decide to come to participate for a clean elections debate. What do they need to be successful? You can you can take this, uh, Bob, since I have you on right now. OK, um, take a lot of downers. No, <laughs> uh, learn to speak to the issue and to be su succinct and do not tell personal stories. Uh, pay attention to what has been going on in the press about issues and pay attention to the <laughs> uh, Compass Questionnaire, which I think we need to talk about integrating the Compass Questionnaire into debates more effectively. That's what I used. I would say if you're running for the legislature, the three biggest budget items are healthcare, public safety, and education. Just be intimately familiar with all three. I would say that um, the idea, I think it was from Lisa earlier, of not giving the questions, but maybe giving the topics it, it, it is super helpful. And, and then I would just say, no lightning rounds. No, don't make it a game show. You have one answer. You have one second to answer. We're going to ask you 10 hard questions. That that doesn't make candidates want to participate. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my dog is in the background going crazy, but let's <laughs> let me let's uh, do one more question. Uh, what will come as a surprise during a debate for a candidate, which is usually a bad thing? But what are what is what will come as a surprise for a candidate? Do you think in uh, in having a debate with uh, clean elections? If the rules weren't followed. The Maybe dreaded a... lightning round. <laughs> you said the lightning round. The lightning round. Yeah, I think I think unexpected questions are are or, or controversial questions, right? Controversial questions. Anyone else that have an experience with any any surprises during a debate or a rowdy audience? Rowdy audience. I once saw a candidate in a clean elections debate say, um, don't vote for me, don't vote, voting is immoral. <laughs> That's a surprise, yeah. <laughs> That's a surprise. <laughs> okay. All right, we got like two. Okay, um, uh, what would a candidate expect from a moderator during the debate? So if you had your perfect moderator, what would that moderator look like and act like? Any, oh, um, uh, Member Fowler, you please take it. Okay, Avery, I think really um, during these debates, I, I think when you really look at for the last couple of years, people have a tendency to come on these debates and say things that are not true. And I think would be really helpful is if we have that moderator check those people, because I think 
right now, people are just not necessarily being really straight and truthful about a lot of things. And, and that sometimes I see people are not necessarily challenged on that. So that, that I think that's important. I, I just feel that integrity, when you allow people to get on these debates and say things and, and you do not check them, um, it really questions the integrity of the debate and the whole process itself. So that's just kind of my two cents. I'd say when you don't know the political affiliation of the moderator after the debate is wonderful. <laughs> A good point. Good point. Uh, Member Simpson, if you'd like to address that, Thank you. Simpson, right um, on the on the moderator. But I think it's important to make sure that we're getting moderators in districts that are familiar with that district's problems, so they can they can do almost live fact checking and knowing knowing um, what's going on. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to have a guy from Sierra Vista moderating a a, a debate in for Flagstaff, because they're not going to be familiar with, with some of the issues. All right, thank you, Mr. Boyer. Uh, we have a, like a few more seconds. Any other last comments, just in general, about the debate process or? Well, I think it came out in the last discussion as well that, um, you know, there's a lot of respect for journalists, moderators who are very familiar with the facts and can, and can, you know, ask the right follow-up question, ask, phrase the question in a way that, you know, the person can't give their standard talking points. So maybe if there were a way to like pair up that um, journalist uh, moderator with like a fact checker who could like live be maybe providing some information and some background, who could do some research while the moderator is moderating um, and just kind of help elevate the factual integrity to use Mr. Fowler's word of the whole enterprise that 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 could be useful. All right, like kind of like a ticker tape. Okay, are we all back together now? Um, okay. Um, can we hear from um, the spokesperson for Group A and for purposes of making this clear? Tom, is that you again? Oh, yeah, except we, we I voiced this on Tara. Oh, okay. Tara. <laughs> Thanks for that, Tom. Well, I mean, if you'd like me to do it, I'm happy. I took notes. No, no, to... no, it's okay. I got it. <laughs> Candidates often decline to participate in debates, citing the perceived bias of the moderator. They also say there is little to gain and much to lose by attending a clean elections debate, especially if they say the wrong thing and it's taped. Candidates need to feel that they will get a fair shake with an impartial and fair moderator and that the debate will make a difference to their race. We can address these issues by taking steps to get moderators who are from the geographical area and who are perceived as fair and impartial. We might also consider pairing the moderator with a journalist who can fact check during the debate. We should create more, incentive, more incentives for candidates to attend, which could include marketing and communication so that there's a broader audience for the debates. Because candidates are often afraid that they'll say the wrong thing and then therefore choose not to attend, we should also consider providing questions or at least areas of questions in advance and limiting the questions to those that are relevant to the office being sought. For example, not including federal questions that don't apply. I had one more note to make, ah, last one, here it is. It is also important for candidates to realize that the purpose of the, of the debate is also for them to learn. Yeah, Tom, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add from your notes. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Expecting that after my presentation. Uh, no, I think I think I think that that about it. I think that I think that uh, you know we're just we're in 
candidates are making choices about where they want to spend their time and then you know and then making and then trying to get some some check on it is important and so I, I don't think i have anything else to add okay thank you and constantine you were the uh, spokesperson for the other group yes i was i was our group's tara she said she set the example the first time through um so the goal is you know how to make this more rewarding for candidates um the the goal should be to increase the number of viewers because that makes it more valuable a debate with 20 people watching it isn't worth going to a debate with 2000 people obviously is and so the questions were could clean elections package promotional materials to the candidates in advance so that the candidates themselves could promote the debates to their audiences um, and could clean elections package the finished product in a way that candidates could share it which comes back to our earlier things of hey here's the whole debate or here's you know the eight different topics broken out in a way that's more bite sized and 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 palatable for for today's social media um, clean elections when they're inviting candidates would be helped by letting view letting candidates know how many previous viewers were watching older debates so candidates can have a sense of the value ahead of time um, letting candidates know the topics in advance, or at least a certain number of the topics in advance, helps candidates to know that the topics they want to talk about will be discussed, which is another reason to participate. Um, we had some additional ideas. Um, one would be to separate the Republican and Democratic primary debates, um, again, because viewers are generally looking at two entirely different races, um, and it, it helps them know that you know, we can customize the topics to to the race, to the candidates, to the audience, and produce a better product. Um, reliable moderators, I guess you guys spend a lot of time on moderators. We also talked about the fact that they need to be reliable as a way of encouraging participation. Um, and one idea was to invite the political parties themselves to select deb debate moderators for the primary debates because they'd be less likely to be biased or perceived as biased or to be attacked as biased. Uh, they would also have a better sense for what issues are important to the viewers and the candidates in that party because it's it's their party um that was it for that was it for group b okay thank you very much uh, some interesting uh, suggestions uh, from both groups um, some overlap but also um, a lot of uh, differing viewpoints uh, before we move on to public comment um Rod McLeod submitted a question on the chat box, which through gross incompetence on my part, I neglected to ask. Uh, he wanted to ask Gina the total advertising budget. Do I have that right, Rod, for um, for clean elections? Gina? Mr. Chairman, uh, group members. So when we are in a an election year, um, we have for the past few cycles had a budget of $1.5 million specifically for the voter education of debates, but also our voter education guide. Um, that budget includes agency costs. Um, so it's, I, I would say maybe in both for the primary and the general. Um, so it's not a full 1.5 million of media buys. I would say it's closer to maybe about 1.1 million dollars in, in media buys. So that's um, historically what our budget specifically for promoting. And again, that's both debates and our voter guide um, in an election year. And mm -hmm. it's like something like 95 debates. Did I get that right? Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, uh, um, Rod, that is that is correct. We with both the primary and the general, thirty legislative districts, and then considering um, you know some of the discussions about possibly splitting them apart, and then also the, all of our statewides too. And then if we have federal, and then if we are if this group considers local as well. So so that is the budget that we have historically operated under. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, and thank you all for your time. Before we. Uh, we go to public comment. Um, are there any members of the public that wish to make a comment? You may use the Zoom feature to raise your hand or come off mute. Any members of the public? I don't see any. Kathy, are you seeing any that I'm not? I do not see any either. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, we'll adjourn. 
Um, I very much appreciate your time. I know you're all very busy people. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you at our next meeting. Thank you very much.